Hello and welcome to Ask GC Anything. After last week's tan line controversies, this week we're going to keep it nice and straightforward. So with that in mind, I'm going to do my best to not answer the following ethical conundrum sent in by CMANS, who asked, if it's wrong to take a KOM if you only manage it because of the perfect tailwind. All right, okay, I can't resist. So, for my money, no, it's not wrong, but it does cheapen it slightly. So, it just doesn't quite feel right, does it? But nevertheless, your name is there in the record books. But if you want a really interesting bit of tech, actually, to help you out here, check out mywindsock.com, which will tell you the exact wind speed and wind direction for all of the fastest times up a climb. That is quite an interesting thing to look at. Make no mistake. Right. Moving on, we've got this question sent in by Sherry Chander. Any tips on commuting to work on the bike and still staying fresh and presentable for the rest of the day? Now, unfortunately, I am not an expert at staying fresh nor presentable. So what I do is that I treat my commute to work as a bike ride. And so I get kitted up and I wear Lycra. And then when I get into work, I have a shower. That way, the only person who suffers at the end of the day is me when I have to put already used cycling kit back on to ride home. But we do have loads more cool tips in this video here actually, which you might want to check out, which is top 10 tips for commuting by bike. Respect your workmates. If you don't have access to a shower at work, firstly lobby your boss to get one installed. Our other suggestion would be keeping your ride relatively easy on the way to work and upping the pace on the way home. Other than that, wet wipes, a shower in a can, or like the boss, wear two t-shirts to stop any whiffs escaping. Next up here is a great question sent in by Sam Ellis, and he's actually not the only one to ask this. Do you think saving for a power meter is worth it? And if so, which one would you go for? Well, let's not go on to the which one should you buy thing, but in terms of is a power meter worth it? I suppose, first it depends what you're sacrificing in order to pay for it. If you're just you know, not buying the odd cup of coffee, then I'd say, well, yeah, absolutely, it's worth it. But do you need one to train properly? Mm, you don't need one. They are absolutely fantastic, and I'd say they're almost essential for pro-level races these days. But for the majority of us, it's absolutely not essential. There's loads and loads of ways to measure your training. And fundamentally, actually, just timing yourself up a climb regularly is one of the best ones. You obviously got to take into account things like wind direction and wind strength. Check out mywindsock.com, in fact. Uh, but ultimately, you can keep a track of your fitness. And you don't need a power meter to tell you how hard to ride either, although they are absolutely great. Now, this next video here, tells you something quite interesting. In terms of riding up a climb and checking the time, you can also extrapolate the power that you were doing up there. So whilst it might not be useful from a training zone perspective, it does at least give you an indication of how powerful you are. So check this video out and it'll tell you all you need to know. How do you know if your power meter is accurate? Well, they've let us in on a little secret. There is a very simple test that you can do to find out. All you've got to do is work out the total weight of you and your bike, and then ride up a hill of known length and height gain. And then using that data, you input it into a spreadsheet, which will, using an algorithm, then tell you what your estimated power output will be. And they recommend that you head over to the website of a chap called Wolfgang Men, who it would appear is a very bright bloke, given some of the cool content that he's got on there. And his algorithm, which is free to use, is accurate enough to gauge the accuracy of your power meter. So, this has, of course, piqued my interest. I want to go and see if my power meter is accurate. That is another genius piece of software that I think you'll agree. Now, let's hit up some quick fire questions. Now, firstly, we've got this from Terry Willard. Uh, should you or can you use inner tubes smaller than your tire? So, for example, using an 18 to 25C tube in a 28C tire. Uh, yeah, you absolutely can use that. The only downside of using a tube that's smaller than a tyre is that when it inflates, it will stretch a little bit more, which means that it'll be slightly thinner. So for weight weenies out there, that means, yeah, you save a couple of grams, but you probably lose a little bit of puncture resistance. But certainly in a jam, I wouldn't have any compunction with that at all. And in actual fact, I think I've probably still got an 18 to 25 seat tyre in my cyclocross bike from the last time I punctured. So there you go, you can get away with it. Right, Marco Marek, 
Uh, I just want to know, is it normal to have different cleat positions for the left and the right foot? When I have them in the same position, I have knee pain in my right knee. Hmm, tricky one this one. So I can imagine there's an awful lot of bike fitters out there poised with fingers over keyboards. Personally, my cleats are not set up in the same position from left and right because the body, as much as we want it to be symmetrical, is rarely symmetrical. You might have a slightly tighter quad in your left leg and a tighter hamstring in your right, and all those things can therefore change what it is feels comfortable on the bike. So if you are comfortable with your cleats as they are, then absolutely leave them. There is certainly no advantage to having cleats in the same position, uh, and certainly there's a massive disadvantage if it's causing you pain. So uh, yeah, just crack on. Uh, many of the world's best bike riders are completely wonky on a bike. So uh, you don't see that from the TV footage, but yeah, people are all over the place. Anyway, right, next up, we've got this one from uh, Stefan Abraham. Uh, what would be the most effective training for managing to hold 300 watts for an hour? Training at 300 watts and slowly trying to increase the duration to one hour, or training for an hour and slowly trying to increase the watts to 300? Well, if I can be blunt with you, Stefan, I'd say neither of those are a very good way of achieving your goal because I think one of the fundamentals about training is variation. So what you probably will find much better is doing rides that are two hours long but at a lower intensity and then mixing them up with rides in which you're riding at 350 watts or even 400 watts for a shorter period of time. And then that will hopefully get you to your target. But make sure you plan and work out a way of getting there. But there are gonna be some times when yeah, absolutely riding for an hour as hard as you can is the right thing to do. But yeah, variation, that's the thing to remember from that. Uh, and then finally, for the old quick fire question round, moonshine, how much does sleep deprivation affect performance? Well, this is an interesting one in that I heard a little rumor from a pro team where they looked into this. And actually they said that sleep deprivation doesn't affect your physical performance as much as people thought, but actually what it does do, which we all know, is it affects your cognitive ability. So your ability to, I don't know, fundamentally ride in a straight line and react in time and stop. So actually you'd be able to go out and ride up Mont Ventoux as fast on little sleep as with plenty of sleep, but you probably be better watch out on the descent on the way back down. Owen Gray has sent in a very interesting question. Is milk a good recovery drink? Now, admittedly, having said at the beginning of this video that we'd steer clear of controversies, we've delved into ethics, we've delved into bike fit, and now the other hot topic, nutrition. So brace yourselves. But effectively, milk, can be a really good drink for recovery because it's got carbohydrates, it's got quite a bit of sugar in there uh, in the form of lactose, and then also it's got quite a bit of protein in there in the form of casein and also whey. So it ticks all the nutrition boxes, uh, then there is a slight issue with it in that firstly some people can't drink large volumes of milk, it just doesn't sit right with them, so therefore it's not a very good recovery drink for those people. But then also if you wanna get specific about it, the casein that's in there, so one of those proteins I mentioned, is actually a really slow release protein. So whereas immediately when you finish a ride, you'd want to neck a load of milk and then have all the protein absorbed into your body as fast as possible, the casein actually slows it down. So you, it's only the whey protein that's going in there more quickly. Now, this may or may not bother you. So fundamentally, milk is a good recovery drink, but if you want arguably the best recovery drinks, then you want to look for those that have more whey protein in them and also something called leucine in there as well, of which we're going to have more information on this channel very shortly, actually. Uh, but in the meantime, recovery isn't just about what you drink or eat as soon as you get off the bike, although that is fundamentally important. But this video hopefully will help you recover faster generally across the board. Immediately after we have finished our exercise, we will want to replenish the nutrient stores in our body as quickly as we possibly can. So you'll have burnt through a fair number of calories, which you want to replace using carbohydrates, and will also have damaged a fair bit of muscle tissue. So you want to try and repair that with the use of amino acids. So as soon as you can, eat or drink something which contains both of these. Yeah, and both are absolutely essential. However, they're essential in different proportions. So you'd probably be looking at a ratio of about three grams of carbohydrate to one gram of protein. 
And if the speed of recovery is important to you, then what you choose to eat is really, really crucial particularly the case of milk, which is a really popular and genuinely effective thing to drink in order to help your recovery. However, it takes much longer to digest than a simple whey or soy protein, for example, because of the other protein that's found in milk called casein, and that has a tendency to sit in your stomach. Effectively, it's kind of what makes cheese, cheese. <laughs> There's no doubt then that recovery drink, a specific product, is very easy in terms of getting something down you very quickly that ticks all of the boxes that we have just mentioned. Finally, we've got a couple of bike tech questions for you. Firstly, this one from David Muner. Uh, is it worth converting a tubed wheel set to tubeless? And then if he does do that, uh, what spares should he carry on a ride? Can he literally not bother taking a pump a spare tube and tie levers with him? Uh, well, firstly, and really importantly, no, you cannot convert a tubed wheel set to tubeless you have to have tubeless specific stuff. So you may find that you've got tubeless specific rims already, but you've just got normal tires and tubes on there. So that's fine, so that's component one sorted, but it's absolutely critical that on a road bike, you do not try and bodge normal road tires and make them tubeless because it's, it's fundamentally dangerous because they can blow off the rim. So you can do it, I found on cyclocross where the pressures are much lower and also the speeds that you're going at are much lower. So the recipe for disaster is a lot less, but don't, don't do it on a road bike. For those of you that are riding tubeless uh, or are thinking about going tubeless properly, then in terms of what you take on a ride, I would still take a tube and an inner tube just in case, because as much as tubeless ensures you against those punctures, the fact is there is still a chance. So you want to be completely safe and sure that you can get home. So yeah, still take a pump, still take a tube, but maybe only one tube instead of two. How about that? Okay, last question then. Uh, this one is sent in by JJ95 East. I want to lower my stem, but I'm not sure if I should cut the extra steer tube. What's the benefit of doing so? And is there any potential dangers or problems with not cutting it? So the benefits of cutting it are that it looks a lot neater. Uh, the benefits of not cutting it are that you could potentially revert your position back up again if you decide that you didn't want your new slam position. But yeah, there are a couple of reasons why you would want to trim that steer tube. Firstly, uh, having something sticking up towards you isn't a great idea. Like, I don't think it's fundamentally dangerous unless it's a massive bit of steer tube, but that isn't great. But then actually, more importantly, on carbon steer tubes, often the way that your headset is tensioned is that you've got this little aluminium sleeve that fits down the top of your steer tube. So if you've got a really big steer tube, that sleeve actually sits further up than your stem. And normally your stem clamps and it basically reinforces the carbon and it makes the whole thing a lot more secure. So if you have a carbon fork, then it's definitely a good idea to make sure that your steer tube is cut to the right length. If you want to know how to cut your steer tube, then as you can see behind me, there is a how-to video showing you exactly how to do it. So I'd give that a bit of a watch if I was you. It's a straightforward process, but it's worth doing it right. With our forks out, we've now got a decision to make. If you want your stem and steer a tube to be completely flush, then you need to take that line that we've just marked and then make a second line three millimeters below it. Now that will give the top cap enough room to actually do its job. So it needs that little bit of space to compress all the bearings back down. However, many of you, and I will include myself in this as well, subscribe to the always have one five millimeter spacer on top of your stem rule. Now, the reason being, that having a little bit of steer tube extending above your stem means that when you come to clamp it, and particularly important with carbon steerers, it's clamped extra securely. Because there is a risk that if the stem extends over the top, it can start to squeeze the carbon steer tube down, potentially deform it and indeed delaminate it. Well, there we go. Hopefully a few more of your questions answer there. If you've got a question for us, then make sure you let us know. Stick it in the comment section down below or send it to us on social media using the hashtag TalkBack. Then also do make sure you subscribe to GCN. To do it, it's very simple. Just click on the globe. And then if you're after some more content right now, then I've got two current and very interesting videos for you. Firstly, click just down there. And actually we've asked the pros, what coffee do they drink before the start of the Giro d'Italia? And then another example of GCN asking other people, we've got the adventurer, legendary adventurer, Sean Conway. What does he take when he goes bikepacking? That one is just down there.